stuff. So I don't have much time. It's not a sermon that I prefer to preach, if I could be honest. But if I want to be faithful to the text, I got to go by everything the Bible says and not by what my feelings and emotions say. So I want to just go straight into it. If you have your Bibles, open it up or open up your apps to uh, Philippians, the book of Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be going through 12 to uh, 21, but for the sake of time, I'm going to just start by reading 12 through 14. And before, when I first started preaching, I, I, I remember... I would start reading the word once I stopped hearing pages. Because I said, I've realized everybody found it. But not everybody uses a phone. It's like, I'm just going to go ahead and assume that you all got it because I don't hear any pages. So Philippians. Philippians. Uh, Philippians is a, an amazing book. Beautiful book. I, I love the book of Philippians. The author is Paul. And Paul has his boy um, Epaphroditus who was on mission with him out there in Philippi, which is part of Rome. And Epaphroditus was really sick, extremely sick. Uh, the people out in, in, in Philippi were worried about uh, Epaphroditus. So Paul ended up writing a letter, and, and, and Epaphroditus, he got better. He got better. Paul sent them out to give him this letter, the church at Philippi, because Paul was locked up in prison. And the prophet died as guest there. And I can imagine the joy that the people of the church at Philippi, what they feel when they realize that they got a letter from the boy Paul. You know, the, the church planter, the, the gospel globetrotter Paul, the, 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 the man, they're getting a letter from him. And they're looking through the letter and they're reading the beginning of the book of, of Philippians. And they're checking it out. All right, we see who wrote the letter. It is Paul uh, and Timothy. Uh, bond servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can assume just me being within the people hearing about this letter. I'm excited about this. And then I'm looking at Paul in verses 3 to 11, how he's praying for me as a body, and I'm enjoying this letter. Then, then, then he gets to this part that doesn't seem so natural. It, it just seems weird to me because he talks about his imprisonment. And he goes on to say, Starting in verse 12. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else. That my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment, and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. If I could put a title to this, I would put it, your suffering counts. Your suffering counts. Can you pray for me as I pray for you all, please? <sighs> Heavenly Father, you are amazing. We thank you, God, for your amazing grace and mercy, Lord. We thank you for being in this place today, for working in our lives ever since the, we were in the womb of our mothers, God. I pray that you would take these words, God, and bless your people, God, and, and that they might use this, if not today, but they would not throw away, but use it on the day of need, God. Even if they can't relate to it today, one day they will, Lord. And I pray that you would impress this in their soul, God, and that throughout it all, they would cling on to the hope of Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for your peace that you have given us in the times of, of trials and tribulations. That we could see the end road, Lord, and we know that you are there. Father, we pray that this time would be one of multiplication, God, in any way possible. I pray that these words would come out as, as if the final words that I could ever preach, Lord, to your people. God, I pray that you would be pleased and that I may decrease so that you may increase. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. I don't know if you've ever seen Million Dollar Baby, crucial movie. It's very gruesome in the blood and the violence that goes on in that movie. But I'm a boxing fan. I, I, I like those type of things. And, 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 and there's a part in the movie where Hillary, Hillary Duff, she gets beat up really bad. It's sort of in the beginning. And Hillary Duff, Hillary, thank you. Too much Disney for me. <laughs> that Hillary. And, man, she's like bleeding, and Clint Eastwood, like, he's there just ready to break her nose or, or something like that. And apparently, this is thing, something that, that, that boxers do. Um, 
and speaking to boxers, what they do is they break their noses on purpose before actually fighting, before actually like getting into the ring. They go through the process of breaking their nose. And they do this because they know that they're going to get punched in the nose. And if they get punched in the nose and it breaks right then and there as they're fighting, they may just stop the fight. They may no longer be able to fight. They may get knocked out. So rather than going through that pain in the middle of the fight, they actually go through the pain in advance so that when the fight actually happens, they don't give up the fight, but they keep on fighting and that they, they could eventually get the victory no matter the pain that they go through in the middle of the fight. So, so I look at this as God, what he does. We've gone through whatever amount of years that you've gone through. And since day one, we have been going through trials and tribulations and growth and maturity and trials and tribulations and sufferings so that that one day, that big fight comes into our life. We don't give up. We could actually rejoice. And that's crazy. Because I'm not trying to rejoice in my suffering. I don't want to live for the kingdom of God in the midst of my suffering. I want to just cry, be alone in the middle of my bed, and nobody around me. I don't want to talk about this stuff. I don't want to go to no counseling or none of that stuff. I just want to soak in my sorrow, soak in my tears because I'm in pain. January 13th, I get a phone call. Missed it. My father calls me. My mother calls me. Missed that one too. I'm in the middle of a prayer call, so I'm being all spiritual and stuff. And my mother sends me a text, I'm sorry for your loss. Now something went down. And a call that I've been waiting for for so long, it reached me. It was my father crying on the other side of that phone. My father, who I've never seen cry much. My father, who for me was the most hardest person I could think of is out on the other side of the phone crying because his baby boy just died of an overdose. And man, I'm in shock. I'm just in shock. Although I was waiting for that call, unfortunately, I knew it was going to happen. It was just constantly praying for him. Lord, take him out, take him out. And at the moment, it's just like, God, why don't you answer my prayer? Like, what's the point of even praying? Like, if you're really all loving, how could you allow that to happen? And the thing is, when I constantly think about my own feelings, my own agenda, my own small uh, castle, and not thinking about God's kingdom, I'm always going to look at, at what are you doing to me, 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 or us, 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 us. I'm not looking at what God wants to do and all that stuff. I don't have the answers. And I'm not even going to sit and stand in front of you acting like I do have the answers. But I know the answer, and that's Jesus. So in the midst of that trial and tribulation, man, I, it's crazy because nobody could know what you're going through. And, and, and sometimes people may not even care. Uh, I'm bawling, crying. And all my daughter was saying, when are you going to feed me? When are you going to feed me? I'm hungry. When are you going to feed me? I'm like, Elizabeth, I'm going through something right now. Uh, but I'm hungry. And I'm like sobbing as I, here's your food, here's your food. And I'm sobbing, and tears all in her food now. Go ahead, eat it. <laughs> but Paul, what he does is he, it, 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 he lives his life in light of the gospel. So instead of living in light of his circumstance, instead of li living life according to his feelings and emotions, and instead of living life according to what's happening today, he's living life in light of the whole picture, the whole gospel. He's living life according to the kingdom of God because he done been through some things. And, and God allows us to go through pain and suffering so that we could continue to fight within our trials. He allows you to go through what you went through before so that tomorrow's trial, you'll be ready for it. As uh, pastor and author Eric Mason says in his book, one of his books, he says, God uses suffering to remove what is in the way of what he puts in us through Christ. He removes outer layers. He removes everything that is stopping us to look more like Christ. And, and as we begin to look more like Christ, he's reaching his mission. God is, because God's point is for us to look more like Christ. He wants, us, he wants heaven to look like a whole bunch of little Christ, a whole bunch of little Jesus all around heaven. And he's going to do whatever it takes so that we can look more like Jesus. And that's, that's not always a blessing. At least it doesn't look like one. So we see here, again, Paul, speaking in verse 12, says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me 
has actually advanced the gospel. All that, had, all that we read started from the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, if we look through Acts chapter 21 to 28, we look at the trials and tribulations that Paul went through. We look at the sufferings. We look at the imprisonments. We look at the, um, the shipwreckage. We look at the abandonments of his people. We, 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 we look at it, and that right there would make anybody want to say, all right, I'm out of here. Peace. I'm not going through this anymore. And, and think about your own life. How many times you wanted to just throw in the towel? How many times you just wanted to give up? Like, I can't take this anymore. Like, I'm done. Last thing I want to do is get on my knees and pray. And, and, and it's like, as soon as you become a Christian, it's, it's just weird. As soon as you, it's like, as soon as you sign that red dotted line, whatever that line is, as soon as we come um, to Jesus, it's like, bam, you just get hit. One trial, one tribulation, and they all start coming to you one at a time. Bang, 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 bang. It's like you're trying to get up, and another one comes to bring you down. They're like waves, right? It's like a, a crazy beat. So we're like, oh, we're trying to overcome one wave, and then another one comes and knocks you down. And, and, and what you don't know is that like, God does not only allow these trials and tribulations. He's actually the one that done designed the whole trials and tribulation. He's weaving it all together in our life just so that we could be more like Jesus. I don't like it, if I could be honest. I'd rather it be all, I'd rather live my best life now, if I could be honest. I'd rather, all, just give me the blessings. I want just blessing, 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 blessing. I want some Oprah Winfrey type of blessings. You get a blessing, you get a blessing. Everyone, that's what I want in my Christian life. But then if that's the case, I'd be creating my own God. So, so, so God, he uses Paul. And Paul doesn't write this letter and say, man, all that I went through, please just get me out of here. Just take me because I don't want to be here anymore. Find a way, because remember, he's in prison now. Find me a way to get out. Like, like open up, like break me out of here. Instead, he's encouraging the people. He's encouraging the, lead, the listeners. And he's saying, hey, everything that I've been through is for the sake of the gospel. All the pain, all the sufferings that I went through. It is to advance the gospel. As a matter, in other words, to advance what he's saying is like it's pushing through like an army trying to invade land. It's just this is what the God. This is what's happening with the gospel. It's pushing through. So my pain is a tool that God is using to push the gospel. I don't want that. I I I rather. Why can't my joy be the tool? Why, why can't my happiness, why can't my comfort, why can't other people hear about Jesus Christ while I'm on a beach? I'm, listen, I give me white sand and, and blue beaches, I promise I will show people Jesus through the beauty of the water. I promise you, God, hear me, I promise you I will. But now, God doesn't always want to do that. As a matter of fact, like H.P. Charles says, Paul is looking at what happens to what happens to you. What happens to what happens to you? It's what happened here. In other words, he isn't looking at why the imprisonment happened, but he's looking at what happened because of the imprisonment. Often, why God, why God, why God? And God is like, I want you to switch it up. Now it's now what, God? Now what? What, what do I do with this stuff? I've learned in, 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 in counseling and even in my own personal life, I, I've learn to, or I'm trying to use my pain as a prophet. I'm trying to use my afflictions as a prophet, and I literally, a prophet, I'm trying to make money off of my, of my trials and tribulations because I'm a counselor. So what I've gone through, all the stuff that was supposed to tear me down, I'm now using it and, and, and to, to make money off of it because the devil ain't going to try to take away my joy and just me not getting anything out of it. So now I sit on the other side of a, of a desk and I counsel others who have gone through it or are going through it. And I'm using what God has put me through to help others get by. So I'm, I've learned, it's when I was working at the jail, I would tell people all the time, you making profit off, off of drugs and you got you locked up. I'm making profits off of drugs right now and I'm a substance abuse counselor. So, so use that pain, I'm telling them, use that pain, use your pain and affliction uh, and, and, and make a profit of it. And not always financially, but help others. How can we bless others? How can we multiply joy in the midst of pain? That doesn't even make sense as I even say it. It really doesn't. But God doesn't always make sense. 
And in verse 13, we look that he says, so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I'm in Christ. This is the opportunity that Paul was given while he's in prison. Now, this was no regular imprisonment. Let me tell you, this, this was no um, Pablo Escobar type of prison where he was able to just make a prison in his own household and invite the Columbia International team and play soccer while he's locked up. No. And Paul was in, in, on some El, El Chapo prison, but not the one he escaped, the Nile prisons where he can't escape, maybe. Uh, like, he, he was uh, tied up. He was chained up. He, Paul was chained up to an imperial guard. Now, in imperial guards, there was only about 9,000 of these guards within the Roman Empire, uh, within Rome. And, and these imperial guards were used for the, for the, the, like, the most dangerous uh, um, prisoners. Now, mind you, Paul is in prison for preaching the gospel. Paul is not in prison for murdering anybody. He's not in prison for stealing. He's not in prison for any of that stuff. He's in prison because he preached the word of God. And they used one of the most elite guards so that he could be in chains with him every single day. And check it out. It wasn't just, uh, uh, he wasn't in chains with him just a little bit of time. He was in chains with this guard all day. In the shower, in the toilet, in the kitchen, if that existed but also in his prayer room. So every time that this guard was with Paul, they heard the gospel. Every time that another, that every time they, they changed shifts, boom, another guard would hear the gospel. And the shift would change, another guard, another guard would hear the gospel. When Paul was on his knees praying for the church at Philippi, crying out to God, it wasn't only God that heard the prayers. But the guard heard the prayers too. And it got to the point that the guards themselves were converting and accepting Jesus Christ through what Paul was doing while in prison. And it got even better because in chapter 4 of the same book, in verse 22, when Paul sends his greetings to the church, he says, as a matter of fact, the guards out in the house of Caesar also send their greetings. In other words, that even the empire, people up in, all up in the emperor's house are accepting Jesus Christ. All because of his imprisonment. What are we doing with our pain and our sufferings? Because Paul is out here preaching the gospel through it. He made sure everybody gets it. And, and, and that's how he handled it. How are we handling it? And if I could just be a bad car salesman today. Because I think every preacher should be a bad car salesman. Because we're not out here to give you just the good news. It's just, just like all oh, the tire is good, although it's like white and it's all messed up. I'm not out here to tell you the, 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 you're never going to need an oil change. Now you're going to need an oil change. Uh, so I want to tell you the truth about this whole gospel thing that we live out. It's not if you go through the pain and suffering, but it's when you go through it. Again, it's not if, but when. And if we're going to be faithful so, God, if you're really going to say, God, I take all of me, if we're really going to sing these songs uh, that he refine me and put me through the fire, if we really want to sing these songs, then we really need to know what it is that we're singing and what we're saying to God. That when we say, God, take all of me, he's going to say, okay. And it's going to get to a point where God is going to take us like a buffalo. For the natives, after a buffalo would die, they would let no piece go to waste. But every single piece of a buffalo would be used. The horn would be used as a, as a whistle or as like a purse. The blood would be used for food or for paintings. The skin would be used for, for coverings, for a teepee to keep you warm. The hooves would be used as a bowl. The same way that every single part of a buffalo was used for the good of the community, every single part of your life will also be used for the goodness of God. Every single thing that you go through every joy, every peace, every suffering, every anger, every thought, everything you go through, God wants to take that and use it for the beauty, for the expansion of his kingdom. Are you ready? Do you really want this? Is this really the Jesus Christ you want? Because you still have time. Here's the beauty of it all. You don't go through it alone. 
We don't go through this pain and suffering. We don't go through God's chiselments or God chiseling us. You know, that's what he does. He's chiseling and chiseling and chiseling and, and, and sculpting us. You know, as a sculptor, you ask the sculptor, how do you know, like, how do you know how to make this sculpt? How, like, how do, you, how do you know where to take out? He's like, well, I see that there's an image inside of this ice. And what I do is I chisel every single piece of this ice so that the image that I see inside is clear. If that don't make sense, it's like the smelter. What he does is he gets the metal, he puts it in fire. He gets the gold. He puts it the gold in fire, and, and the smelter. What he does is he knows that the gold is ready he, to come out of the fire when he sees his reflection uh, in the gold. So, so God, what he wants to do is he wants to see his reflection in your life. And sometimes he's gonna make us go through some things on purpose so that we could look more like Jesus Christ. I don't like it. I don't. But it's the truth. This is what happens. We see it with Paul. But again, he doesn't allow us to go through this by ourselves. We, we, he gives us a helper. And in verse 14, we see that our pain and suffering, it's not only for non-believers. But it also encourages the body. We look at verse 14. He says that most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment. And they're even more to speak the word fearlessly. So now, because, like, they're hearing what Paul went through. And, and anybody who was scared to preach this word are now preaching this like a fierce lion. Just ready, just out there with no fear whatsoever. Because they're looking. People are looking. So when they look, they're like, all right, I'm encouraged now. I see Paul. He, he's locked up. He done been through some things. Man, I'm not even going through anything. I could preach this word. I remember when the uh, first COVID tests were coming out and all that stuff. Um, my daughter had to get tested. And these were when the videos were out where, like, Q-tips being stuck all the way up to your brains. And I'm like, man, and I'm going with my daughter. I was like, look, I, ain't, I, I didn't have to take it. She did. I was like, Elizabeth, I'm, I'm going to take it with you. I'm going to go first. That, you know, so that she could be encouraged. So she could see uh, I'm still alive after this stuff. Uh, and, and thankfully, I, with the, all the pain that I went through, it, she was able to do it. But apparently, they didn't stick it all the way up to their brain to the kids. They just did it, like, right there in the beginning of the nose. With me, I felt like it was coming out the back of my head, the way they stuck that thing. And one time, that thing even made me bleed. Thankfully, my daughter already took the test. But God uses our trials and tribulations so that others could be encouraged. Right? You, you ever meet somebody and just ask them, how are you doing this? One of our best friends, man, not too long after I heard about my brother, they sent us a text like, hey, well, my three-year-old just found out she has cancer. A three-year-old. Like, what do you say? What do you do? For every day you spend with your child, you want to just, you want it to never end. You want to just go to sleep with your eyes open so that you can look at her, at that child all day, every day. Because now it's in the bone marrow. And she works in a cancer unit. So it's like she knows all that is expected. And God allowed that to happen. But why, God? Right? That's my, why? But it's also a question. It's like, how? Like, how are you even going through this stuff? So Paul's sufferings... It was for others were to hear the word of God, and, and, and because of his sufferings, other people preach, and other people preach. And the people that were preached to, their traje the trajectory of their life now has been changed, and their families have also been saved. And it all starts because of God sending Paul through trials and tribulations, and now churches are planted, and, and cities are, are transformed. And, and now we even get to hear the gospel today in 2022. Like we get to read this stuff. Because Paul didn't give up while he was in the midst of the trials and tribulations. But he lived life according in light of the gospel, not in light of his current situation. You know, I've seen the pains and afflictions. I've seen the sufferings. But I also see that all things work for good for those who love the Lord. I've also seen God being faithful. I've seen God walk through the fire when we're walking through it. I've seen God not just look from a distance like, hey, y'all good over there? No, I've seen God get down up in the hole with his people. And so that whatever bad thing that happens to us is actually meant for good. It doesn't make sense. I don't like it. I don't want it. But if I want to 
truly serve Christ, if I want him to be my master, that means that I belong to him and all of me belongs to him. You see, we want to be intentional. Sure, get your prayer time. Sure, get your reading time. Do it. Get your fellowship time. But how about our suffering time? So throughout all of this, all this pain and suffering, Paul tells us in chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice. How am I supposed to rejoice? Like, how? Um, um, you know, people were burying their child. And how, how, what, you want me to rejoice in the, in the midst of all this stuff? Like, I'm going through it, and I'm supposed to rejoice? The, the, how? And the thing is that God wants to use our hardships to shape and transform us. And once we see the outcome, it's actually part of that. It actually allows us to rejoice. So I, I, I got to start closing up. Quickly, verses 15 through 19, Paul then begins to write about people who are preaching the gospel. And he says, you know, there's a group of people who are preaching this word out of good intentions. They're doing it with love. They're doing a good job. But there's another group of people who are not doing it with good intentions. As a matter of fact, they're trying to come at me. You know, it'd be your own people sometimes that are trying to bring you down even while you're already down. And, and, it's, and it's not outsiders. This is the church itself. He says... They're preaching the word of God. He, he, he's not saying, don't listen to them. They're preaching heresy. They're preaching idols. No, nah, they are preaching Jesus Christ. He says that others, pro, verse 17, others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. They, but they're proclaiming, they're proclaiming Christ. Not sincerely, but they're proclaiming Christ. Thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. I love what he says in verse 18. This is what a man or a woman who is living in light of the gospel says. Right, he doesn't tweet about it. He doesn't post about it. He doesn't tell everybody, oh, nobody loves me, nobody cares. He says, eh, oh well. As long as the gospel is being spread, that's all that matters. They could do what they want. I've been through worse. But here's the thing. And one could say, well, how do you get to that point? You got to understand, Paul went through some things. His nose was already broken before that boxing fight so that when he's there in the middle of the fight, he doesn't get knocked out when he gets punched in the nose. He's able to get back up. And church, I tell you this, that God allows us to go through some things so that we could get back up. I know that we're crying and we're suffering now, but tell, let me tell you something that there will be a day that we'll be able to get back up. As a matter of fact, there will be one day where there will be no more pain and no more suffering and no more tears. There will be one day they will be able to look at the Lord and Jesus Christ, our Savior, face to face, up in heaven, casting down our crowns, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. To that day, brothers and sisters, God got us. God got us. And, 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 and Paul, he, he's telling the people, look, man, I just want y'all to pray for me. Like, just pray for me because we're not supposed to go through sufferings and pain and isolation. This is what a body is for. God wants us to go through it as a body, feel what we feel, rejoice with those who rejoice and cry with those who cry. But he's saying, I don't only need you to pray for me. I need that spirit of God to hold me down. And he, at the end, he's able to go through all of this stuff. He said, look, man, whether, they, whether I live, all good. I die, all good. Because to live is Christ and to die is gain. And he had the perfect example of what it is to suffer. Because there's someone years before him who suffered, who suffered on a cross for you and for me. He was persecuted. He was just beat up. He was just basically killed alive, if I could say. He wasn't even recognized. Someone who came, who was a perfect being, God came down to earth in the form of a human being in Jesus Christ. And he suffered on the cross so that you and I could be with God forever and not go through this stuff anymore. Even on earth, God allows us to feel delivered while we're in the midst of trials and tribulations because that's what God does. Now, there's a group of you who may know who Jesus Christ is. And praise God, you know what peace in the midst of a storm is. And if you don't yet, you'll get there. But there's another group who doesn't know who Jesus Christ is. And I don't know how you go through all that you go through. I just know that I won't be able to do it. So I want to invite you who do not know Jesus Christ, come to Jesus. 
Come and know a Savior who suffered. And during his suffering, he was able to have joy because he saw the final destination. And the, and, and the sufferings of this world do not compare nothing at all to the glory that awaits us in heaven. Brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you all that whatever it is you're going through, I, I, don't, I may not be able to get it, but we do, we do have a Savior who does, not, who does sympathize with us. He empathizes with us. He doesn't just see us from a distance. Nah, he doesn't put up a, 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 a uniform of a human being so that he could feel just like us. And that's Jesus. Do you want him today? Do you want him today? Doesn't mean your trials and tribulations are going to go away, but it means that you know that you have the solution, and that's in Jesus Christ. Let us bow our heads. Father, we need you. I, I need you. I, I need you. I need you. And that's, that's my prayer. I just need you so bad, Lord. I, I need you in the midst of my anger, in the midst of my sadness, in the midst of my joy. And I don't like the suffering. I don't like the pain that you put me through, God. I don't like it. But I don't want to just live for me, God. I don't want to be indulged in this selfie society that we live in, God. I want to truly live for your glory. And if that's what it takes, Lord, let your will be done and not mine. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters who, who are going through it, God. I pray that they would see the hope in Jesus Christ, that they see that the affliction creates endurance, and the endurance pre creates character, and that character, with that character comes hope, and not an empty hope. We don't hope like those that have no hope, God. We hope in Jesus Christ, who is the Prince of Peace, who came, who is Emmanuel, who is with us right now, Lord. I pray for those who do not know you, that they would get to know you, God, and they, they, we, they would get to know a true peace in Jesus Christ, Lord. I pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Amen.